Greetings again today in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We have visitors with us. We're glad you're here. We appreciate all of our visitors and, of course, always glad to see our members. We have a beautiful, auspicious day in which to worship God, and it's good to see you in the house of the Lord. Now, you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking, and you in the radio listening audience, if you get on your phone, call a friend, have them to tune in and get this hour coming up, I'm sure we could be an inspiration to them. And today's tape will be tape number 228. You write in and send a gift of $3.00. And request the tape, we'll send them to you. That can be a blessing to you in your home, in convalescent homes, or places where you can use them. A man carried one of my tapes to a prison here some time ago, and quite a few people got saved as a result of listening to it. Write in and get a list of our tape. We can send you a list of some 226. Tape today will be 228, of course. Let me mention just a few of our tape. Uh, the tape number... 221, the man who was in great trouble because of the coat he wore. And then tape number 224, uh, the man and wife that hid their baby three months. Tape number 216, the tongues and the charismatic movement. Now, everybody needs this tape because the charismatic movement today is doing untold damage among many believers. I preached in a church Friday night and and about three of these people got up and walked out on me because it got too hot in the kitchen. They couldn't stand the fire. And they got up and walked out. Now, the trouble is a lot of people are willfully ignorant. They don't want to hear anything that they figure that might have to do with them if they're wrong and they're not going to accept the truth. And you have a lot of these poor people willfully ignorant. And you can get that tape, tape number 216, Tongues in the Charismatic Movement. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards. P.O. Box 501 Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. You pray for me and write to me, and I appreciate it so very much. There's a dear man and his wife, before they married, they uh, wrote many, many letters, love letters to each other. And after they got married, then they put them all up in the attic, and they had a little son born in the home, and he began to grow up. One day he came in, and tired and sweaty and the mother said son what in the world have you been doing where have you been he said I've been playing uh, postman she said what do you mean you've been playing postman he said well I went up in attic got them old stinking letters up there and put one in every box on this block and so he was giving out the mail so you have to be careful what you hide away because these little fellas sometimes will find it and, and uh, scratch it out and carry it somewhere. I'm speaking on the subject, Adam and Eve, Christ and the church. I want you to turn to two, two different places, Romans chapter 5 and Ephesians chapter 5, for the reading of God's word today. There used to be a man that every time he mentioned something in his home, he always called it mine, my uh, radio, my refrigerator, my table, my cabinet, my chair, everything he referred to, he'd say it was mine. His wife kept saying to him, so can't you say it's ours? Why do you have to say it's mine all the time? And she warned him about it and said she's getting tired of it. And he kept referring to everything in the home as being mine. And one day she just cracked him in the head with a frying pan, knocked him as cold as a cucumber. They carried him to the emergency room. And there they kind of revived him. He began to shake his head and Kind of revived a little bit. He said to his wife, said, Honey, if you'll hand me our pants up there, we'll go home. <laughs> and so that made the difference. All right, I'm going to read from Romans chapter 5. You know, you can make believers out of people because some of you women, you have a hard-headed husband. It might take two licks of the frying pan. And about the only thing some husband wives have in common is they both got married at the same time. That's been about it. Now, Romans chapter 5 and verse 14. 
Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over all them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is a figure of him that was to come. Now, Adam here was a figure of him to come, who was Christ, of course, and Adam was the type of Jesus. And I'm speaking on Adam and Eve, Christ, and the church. Now turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, will you please? And let me read a verse or two found there. If you have the original Scofield Bible, it's page 1255. I want to read verses uh, 30-33. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let everyone in particular so love his wife, even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now the message I'm going to bring out today of Adam and Eve, Christ and the church, you find a beautiful type in Adam and Eve that you find in Christ and the church. I want you to make the comparison. Now Adam is a type of Christ. A son here is a bride of Eve, of course. Type of Christ, son is bride is a type of the church. Uh, and I want you to notice that in the scriptures. So let's look at thought number one. And that is Adam's bride was proposed by God before her creation. Now here that God Almighty had promised Adam a bride. And she is proposed by God before he created her. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. I will make a helpmate for him. So God when he placed Adam in the garden. He saw it wasn't good for man to be alone, and God said, I'll make a helpmate for him. And before he ever made that helpmate, God promised to do so. The same thing is applied to the bride of Christ, which is the church. Now, you must keep in mind the church, the true born-again believers, they constitute the, the bride of Christ. You're saved, you're part of the bride of Christ. I'm not talking about just merely joining a local assembly. I'm talking about being part of the body. You get into the body of Christ the moment you're saved. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. According as he has chosen us in him. Before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy. And without blame before him in love. So the Bible said God chose us. He chose you. He chose me. That is he chose the church before the foundation of the world. God had planned to give his son Jesus a bride. And God planned that all out. And God said in due time, that bride would be, of course, established or baptized into the body of Christ. And that's what happens when a person gets saved. He's baptized into the body of Jesus Christ. So Adam was in the garden, walking around with the animals. He had named the animals. He was an intelligent man. And yet he didn't have a companion. God said, I'm going to give him a companion. And that he did. Our second thought is this one. Adam's bride lived because his side was wounded in sleep. Now, Adam is the only, uh, the first man, rather, to be put to sleep for surgery. Now, you, you, you know the answer. Somebody asked you, do you know the first person ever put to sleep for surgery? Tell him, Adam, God put him to sleep and God operated on him. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 and 22, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and closed up the place instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto him. So you see, Eve was taken from Adam's side. While God put him to sleep, and while he slept, God performed surgery. God took a rib from his side and there he made a woman and placed her by his side that she might be his helpmate. There might have been a few times during his sojourn there that he might have wished he had his rib back. The Bible doesn't say. There may have been a few times whenever Eve had to say Adam is absent without leave. And there might have been a few times when Adam had to say to her, I, got, I promise you, I promise you from the depths of my heart you're the only woman in the world for me. I promise you that. And then he might have been hard. Kind of hard to make a convince her that. She was the only woman in his life. But anyway God gave. Eve to Adam. Taking a rib from his side. And there made a woman. From that rib. 
While Jesus was hanging on the cross, the soldier came, took that spear, and penetrated that spear into the side of Adam, or rather Christ. And out came blood and water. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, For as much as you know, you will not redeem with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So that blood came from the side of the Son of God. When God got ready to there prepare a bride, a wife, a helpmate from Adam, he took the rib from his side. When due time came for God to purchase the church, he had the spear of Jesus, a spear of stuck in Jesus' side by a soldier, and out came blood and water. Now Jesus took some of that blood, he went back to heaven, and he walked into the Holy of Holies in heaven, behind the veil, there on the altar, he placed that blood, that was the precious blood of the Son of God. In that blood, there was no sin. And that blood atoned for the sins of mankind. We're making a study of the book of Hebrews in our Sunday school department. We're having a good time every Sunday morning in that Bible study. And in the book of Hebrews, this comes out very clear about Jesus' blood being placed on the altar. Now the Son of God carried that blood that came from His side, from His heart, carried that back up into heaven into the Holy of Holies. In Old Testament days, the high priest had to take the blood of a little animal, a little lamb or goat, and carry it back into the Holy of Holies once a year. And there God looked over the sins of the people for another year. When another year rolled around, then the high priest did the same thing over and over again every year and carried that blood in there. And God looked over the sins for another year. Now God did that until God's own lamb took his own blood and carried that into heaven into the Holy of Holies. Now the blood of those animals could not atone for sin, that is, pay the sin debt. God just merely looked over their sins until the payday came. Now the payday came when Jesus died on the cross. God looking over the sins of people all the way from Adam down to Calvary. And then on Calvary, uh, Jesus Christ shed his own blood, perfect blood, the very blood of God, no taint of sin in it. Uh, Mary human blood could not have atoned for sin. Moses' blood could not have done it. Uh, Daniel's blood could not have done it. Joseph's blood could not have done it because their blood was uh, tainted with sin like yours and mine. It had to be spotless, perfect blood. And that was the kind of blood that Jesus had in his veins. In his veins ran the blood of God. God placed that in there, and it had no sin in it. Now, look what Simon Peter said about it. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, For as much as you know, you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Simon Peter said that was precious blood. The precious blood of Jesus, perfect blood, spotless blood, came from a perfect spotless man, the God-man Jesus Christ. Now back in the days of Noah, when God got ready to spare the family of Noah and uh, destroy the old world, God didn't say, now Noah, I want you to take your family, climb up on top of the boat, and come down through a hole in the top. No, no. God said, Noah, I want you to take you and your family. I want you to come into the side of this ark, come through the door, and when you get through the door in the side of this ark, I will shut the door, and you'll be perfectly safe, you and your family. That's exactly what Noah and his family did. They came in through the side of that ark, into the door, into the inside of that boat. Now that door there is a type of Jesus Christ, our door. You only get into heaven through the door, which is Christ. Now we come to thought number three, and that is, Adam's pride was part of his own body. Now let that sink in for just a moment. The bride of Adam, who was Eve, was part of his own body. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2 and verses 21 and 22, and he took one of his ribs and made a woman. So his wife was part of him, the Bible tells us. Uh, the bride of Christ is part of the body of Christ. The Word tells us so. 
In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 30, it says, We are the members of His body, of His flesh, and of His bones. Every saved person here today, every saved person out in the radio listening audience, every saved person on the earth today is part of the body of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus is the head. We constitute the body. Every time a person is saved, he's added to that body. That body is the bride of Christ. Just like Eve was taken from the side of Adam and, and she was part of him, then we are part of the body of Jesus Christ. Now what God is doing now, he's building a body. He's building a bride for his son Jesus. The head of that body is already in heaven. Jesus Christ is the head. Now when God finishes the body, when it's complete, it may be today, it may be next week, it could be a month, a year, several years, but when it is completed, then God will draw the body to meet the head in the air and the body and the head to be complete together. But you are part of that body. Where? I don't know. Somebody said to me one time, said Preacher Edwards, I know I'm part of the body and I know exactly where I've been fitting into that body. I said, where, sir? He said, I'm the coin on the little toe. He said, everybody steps on it every time they come near me. And that's exactly where I am. Well, we don't know where we are in the body of Christ. We are somewhere in that body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, the only definitive verse in the uh, Gospels, that is rather in the epistles, in the church epistles, that tell you when you received your baptism of the Holy Ghost. This is the only verse. You can't go back and base the baptism of the Holy Ghost on any other scripture in the Bible. This is the only one. This is the church's baptism. This is your baptism. You were baptized with the Holy Ghost the moment you were saved. The Holy Ghost baptized you into that body. He's the one that did it. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. You ought to underscore that verse of scripture. By one spirit are we baptized into the body of Christ. That's the way you got in. You didn't get into the body of Christ by joining a local assembly. You didn't get into the body of Christ by reforming. You didn't get into the body of Christ by uh, turning over a new leaf or by water baptism. You got into that body by the baptism of the Holy Spirit the moment you were saved. And that's the only baptism of the Holy Spirit today for the church age. Now there's many fillings, but only one baptism, and that takes place the moment that you are saved. You must keep that in mind. So many people confused today about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They try to go back and say, we're going to have an experience like they had on the day of Pentecost, or like they had in Acts chapter 19, or like they had in Acts chapter 10. No, no, you don't repeat those experiences. Your experience today, the baptism takes place the moment that you're born again, you're baptized in the body of Christ. Now you'll have some poor souls today that's ignorant and fail to rightly divide the word of truth and been taught wrong by uh, preachers. And they'll ask you, if you tell them you're saved, they'll ask you, have you received the Holy Ghost? Or have you had the baptism? Or have you been sanctified? If you're a child of God, then look them straight in the eyes and say, yes, sir, I surely have. I was baptized with the Holy Ghost and sanctified the moment I was saved. The Bible said when you're saved, you're set apart in the body of Christ. God has set apart those he redeemed for himself. And that sanctification comes the moment that you are saved. You're set out of Adam in Christ. There God places you in the body of Christ. You're still in the old Adamic body, but positionally speaking, you're in Christ Jesus. And so you've been sanctified. You were sanctified the moment you were born again and you were baptized with the Holy Ghost, the moment you were born again, that's the only way you could get into the body of Christ. And you were placed in there at your baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost is the same person. You must keep that in mind. That brings us to thought number four. Adam's bride was formed by God himself. God Almighty formed Adam's bride. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 and 22, and the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her to Adam. 
Now, every good man needs a wife because of some things are going to happen that you can't blame on the government. So you need your wife to blame it on. Now, that's what Adam did. He blamed about everything that went wrong on his wife. So at least you have somebody to blame uh, your errors on. Now, these poor boys that don't have a wife, but they can just blame it on the governor. They can blame it on the president. They can blame it on uh, the mayor. But if you got a wife, you can blame your problems on her. That's what Adam did. And so God made that helpmate. Now, Christ's bride is being formed by God himself. See, God formed Eve. God made Adam a helpmate. God did that himself. God is the one that took that rib and made a woman. Now, it's God that's forming a body uh, for his son, Jesus Christ, forming a bride, if you please. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter... And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God said to that group, he said, uh, I'm going to build my church upon the testimony that Peter gave. He said, thou art Peter. Peter had just given a testimony, thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, upon that testimony, I will build my church. And God started building his church, and he brought it into existence into one body, on the day of Pentecost. He brought in component parts of it later on in uh, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19, and then, of course, Acts chapter 8. He brought them in, component parts, the Samaritans, believers of John the Baptist and, and uh, the Gentiles and so forth. But anyway, God said, I'll build my church. And from that time until now, God has been building his church. Every soul that's saved is part of that church. God is building that church. God is the one that builds the church. He saves the soul. He places the body, the soul into the body of Christ. He does it. You don't do it. All false doctrine today, all cults today are based on uh, humanism or human efforts. That is, if you will check, you'll find that they are based on what man does and his rules and his regulations. But people, they are saved by the grace of God. They had nothing to do with it. You don't have any more to do with your second birth. You had to do with your first birth. Salvation is of the Lord. And people that believe the truth today believe in the grace of God. And they believe that salvation is of the Lord. But you check every cult in the land today and you'll find that their salvation is based on human efforts. Do's and don't do. Affiliations and associations and whatnot with certain ecclesiastical powers. But beloved, we are saved by the grace of God, baptized into the body of Christ, and become part of the bride-to-be. Now in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. See, you don't work to get saved, but you work after you're saved. God gives you salvation and God says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What is meant by that is this. I'll illustrate it. A man goes out, he plants a garden. The seed's in the ground. And then when the seed comes up, he works out his garden. And so God saves you. God Almighty quickens you, makes you alive. You become a saved person. And then after you're saved, you have to work out your garden as it were. You have to work out Work for God, clean up your life, do that which is right, because you're already saved and not to be saved. In Acts chapter 15, verse 14, Simeon had declared how God first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. There you have the great debate, the great conference held in Jerusalem. When Paul and his workers came back to Jerusalem, giving a testimony of Gentiles that had been saved, then those Jews, they all got together and they said, Now, what should we do about these Gentiles? What should they do as Christians? And they had a real hot debate there in Jerusalem. Now, Brother James was a pastor of the church in Jerusalem. Now, James was a half-brother of Jesus. James is the one that wrote the epistle of James. Now, the apostle James had already been killed and cut his head off. But James here was the head of of the church in Jerusalem. Not Peter. Not Peter. Peter was not the head of the church in Jerusalem. James was the head of the church in Jerusalem. And after the great debate, and then they finally came to an agreement, and Brother James stood up. 
And Brother James said, Simeon, that is Simon Peter, had declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. In other words, they came to agreement that God at that time now was turning to the Gentiles and he would call out a people for his name from among the Gentiles and what Jews that would be saved. And God has been doing that from that hour until now. You'll find the church today mainly made up of Gentiles. There's a few Jews in it. You may say, preacher, who is a Gentile? Everybody that's not a Jew is a Gentile. And God is calling out a people from among the Gentiles to make a bride for his son, Jesus Christ. And so they agreed to that and they carried the message back to the Gentiles that they'd been ministering to. And so God is calling out this people. Number five, Adam's bride was created to be his helpmate. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I'll make him a, mate, a helpmate for him. God said it's not good for man to be alone. He needs a companion. Christ his bride was created to be his helpmate. Your wife is your helpmate. And the church of Jesus Christ is God's helpmate. And that says that Christ is helpmate to do God's job on the earth. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 1. Then we are workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. So we are Christ is helpmate. See, Jesus Christ is not here in person. He's not walking around in this church building. He's living in your heart in the person of the Holy Spirit. And we are his helpmate. We are the ones to go witness and win people to God and do what we can to build up the, the church and so forth. Jesus left us that great commission. He went back to heaven. He said, I'm going away, but I'm coming back. And while I'm going, you are my helpmate. I want you to do the work. You're ambassadors from heaven down here doing the work down here on the earth. And God expects us to do that. Number six, Adam's pride was presented to him. And Genesis chapter 2 and verse 22, And the Lord God brought her unto him. God brought Eve unto Adam. And God can bring your bride unto you. God knows the woman that will best fit you. God knows the woman that make you the best helpmate. A lot of people run ahead of God, think they know more than God, choose their own companion without considering God. Every young person ought to consider God. If you're a Christian, that's something you ought to pray much about. That is, pray about who is going to be your lifelong companion. And when you find your lifelong companion, then you found the one God wants you to have, and then you're saved. So many people run ahead of God. They say, well, I'll get married. If it doesn't work out, I'll get divorced, and I'll marry somebody else. God's not in that kind of business. God will lead you to the right person if you're willing to humble yourself before God and wait and pray and look to God to lead you. God can do that. I believe that with all of my heart. God knows what you need. God knows the kind of companion you need. And God can choose it better than you can. But you must wait on God. And she was presented to Adam. God said, Adam, here she is. Now, I believe Eve was a very beautiful woman. Now God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden to care for the garden. Now like I've heard other preachers say, God didn't plant Adam and Steve in there. He planted Adam and Eve in the garden. You have men today, uh, ignorant uh, uh, sodomites marrying men, marrying men, and women marrying women. Well, that's abomination in sight of God. God didn't say to Adam, I'm going to give you Steve. He said, I'm going to give you Eve. And there he made a woman. And God meant for men and women to marry. Not men marry men and women marry women. That's abomination in sight of God Almighty. And you need to realize that. That's never God's plan. And so he said then, here she is, Adam. Now Christ his bride should be presented to him. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. There's a day coming when the Holy Spirit is going to take the bride of Jesus and carry the bride of Jesus to meet the Lord in the air. And you're part of that bride. The Holy Ghost will take you up there. Jesus, the bridegroom, will come into heaven. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18. you come with a great shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. And the Holy Spirit will say to God's bride, 
I'm going to present you to the bridegroom. And the Holy Ghost is going to call all the bodies of our loved ones that's now in the cemetery that died in Christ. He's going to bring them out first. Then the Holy Spirit is going to translate and transmigrate all of us that's alive on the earth when Jesus comes. We'll rejoin, we'll join our loved ones that's in now in the grave and we'll go up together. I have a mother and dad down here in the cemetery. If I'm alive when Jesus comes, my mother and daddy will come out of that grave and I'll join them and we'll start shouting all the way to meet Jesus in the air. Yeah. And we'll, have, we'll be the bride, the complete bride. The Holy Ghost will say to Jesus, here she is. Here's the church. Here's the bride. I've been working on it for 2,000 years. I've called out these people. Here they are. And he'll present us to the Lord Jesus Christ young in the air. We'll go back to heaven to have our work scrutinized and then be rewarded according to our efforts, and then we'll go to the marriage supper, sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then we'll come on our honeymoon. You say, preacher, where are we going? We're going over into Jerusalem with Jesus and stay there a thousand years on a thousand-year honeymoon. But God is going to have the church presented to Him. The Bible says, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 27, He might present to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. Then finally, Adam fried was his glory. Adam's pride was his glory. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 7, but the woman is the glory of the man. Adam said, this woman is my glory. All those animals around there in the Garden of Eden, but God said, she's my glory. I'm married to her. She's a human being. She's my glory. Now Christ's pride is his glory. Your wife should be your glory. Christ's pride is his glory. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 12 that we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. So the church of the living God is the glory of Jesus Christ. The bride of Christ. And God is looking forward to having his bride to meet him in there. Just like a young couple that's planning to get married. They put the pictures in the paper. They're now sitting engagement. They're waiting. They can hardly wait till that day comes. God is now in heaven. Jesus Christ, the bridegroom-to-be. Eliezer, the Holy Ghost, is down here gathering the bride. And he'll finish the bride, gathering it all out. And when it's finished, he'll carry us to meet Jesus in the air and we'll be with the bridegroom forever and rule and reign with him forever. How wonderful to be a part of the body of Jesus Christ. Many years ago, this is a true story, there's a man on a train, had three little children, and, of course, on this train they had sleepers. You had to travel a long distance. They had three little fellows, and one of them was just a little baby. And that baby started crying, and all during the night he'd have to walk up and down the aisle to try to keep that baby from crying. And the people became irritated. They said, uh, a man said, why don't you uh, do something about this? You're keeping us all awake, that baby crying, and we can't sleep. Why don't you give that baby to its mother? The man said, I... Would to God I could, man. Said, I wish I could. Said, Mother is in a coffin back there in the next box, and we're carrying her now to bury her. I wish I could give this baby to a mother, but God's called her home, and I can't give this baby to his mother. Another man heard him and crawled out of his bed and said, Fella, said, let me have that child, and you get you some rest. He took that baby in his arms and uh, walked up and down the aisle and let the man get a little rest. He said, Fella, I lost my wife one time and I had to raise my babies by myself. I can sympathize with you. Let me help you out. And he helped him. It's sad whenever a husband dies and, and uh, leaves little children for a mother to raise. When she can do it better than he can, that's bad. That's bad. But it's far worse when a mother dies and leaves little babies for the husband to raise. That's sad indeed. That's bad. But those things do happen. I want to thank God for our companions. Thank God like Jesus. Thanks God for his bride to be the church. That's come to a great meeting in the air. Let's all stand our feet. Our Father, I pray today you'll take the message and use it to your glory. May your name be honored. May Jesus be glorified. May somebody be saved out in the radio listening audience. We pray that you'll speak to people in this building. Lord, we know this will be a good time for people to get saved or reclaimed or rededicate their lives or unite with this assembly. May your name be honored, I pray, in this invitation for Christ's sake.
Amen. Now listen to me. Debbie's going to play softly on the organ. If she plays, if you're here unsaved, if you'll come down here, we'll help you to God. If you're backslidden on God, if you'll come down, we'll help you back into fellowship. Or if you want to rededicate your life, or if you want to unite with this church the way we receive members, you come down and I'll take over. We'll do something about that. While she plays, I've given you the message. Now it's up to you to respond. You can respond. You have that opportunity now to respond. What you doing? I can only give you the message of God. I can't make you come forward. God not going to save you against your will. God not going to force you to rededicate your life. God accepts people on a willful basis if they're willing. The work of God's done on a willful basis. If you're not willing to do the work of God willfully, then it's not accepted by God. But God rewards and blesses those that do things willfully for Him because they love Him. While we wait, would you come? I feel like somebody ought to move forward.